So welcome back uh, to the next uh, lecture of for of interest complexity. Uh, this is the four last lecture uh, on this course. Uh, so the last two lectures will be about uh, hardness uh, in for of interest complexity. So in particular, we will uh, show some tools and some methodologies for showing that uh, different uh, parameterized problems do not have a FPT algorithm or do not have FPT algorithm with certain uh, running types. Um, during this lecture, we will be um, talking about the first aspect. So we'll uh, give a methodology for showing that uh, a certain uh, problem is not solvable in fixed parameter time unless uh, something happens. Um, however, yeah, the next lecture will be about more precise uh, running time guarantees. So parameterized hierarchy. So we would like to uh, have a, a theory, devise a complexity theory, uh, using which we will be able to show that something cannot be done, right? Uh, so you probably know already one such theory uh, or have seen it uh, on some courses uh, uh, for showing hardness uh, uh, in, in conditional hardness lower bounds for, uh, for computational problems. And this is the theory of NP hardness. So this is uh, theory for, of lower bounds against the existence of polynomial time um, algorithm. And during this lecture, I would like to uh, give you the theory for par, uh, the, can, the parameters counterpart of this, this theory, uh, the theory of so-called W1 hardness. Uh, and we will be uh, using a lot of uh, uh, analogies between these two, uh, these two um, Areas uh, because well certain uh, aspects and why we are doing certain things uh, can be can be understood better if you see the analysis. So in so if we are going to design a complexity theory for for parameters problems, um, then we essentially need to have four ingredients uh, to understand uh, um, how this uh, how this works. So first of all, the first ingredient is the object of study. So we need to understand what. As what exactly are we talking about? What problems are we uh, are we cons uh, are, are, are we considering? So, in the normal uh, theory of NP hardness, we are considering a standard uh, computational problems. A computational problem is uh, uh, just a language which is a subset of uh, some alphabet cell, say binary alphabet uh, star. So, uh, it consists of words uh, over uh, alphabet zero one, and these words are. Um, are understood as instances, as uh, encodings of instances that are yes instances of our problem. So for instance, if we are thinking about uh, some SAT problem, uh, then a language would be uh, corresponding to the SAT problem would correspond to um, all the encodings of, uh, of um, propositional formulas that are satisfiable. Right, so the, the usual problem is that we are given uh, a set, uh, a string x, yes, which is the, uh, the encoding of our instance, say, encoding of a graph. And for the set x, we want to understand, we want to determine whether uh, x is in our language, uh, which means whether x is a yes instance of our problem. So in the world of NP hardness and in parameterized complexity in general, we are not uh, considering classic problems, we are con uh, considering parameterized problems. So there are many different ways of defining parameterized problems. The, the, the easiest way is to say that the parameterized problem uh, consists of the input, the instance itself, and the parameter given as a second coordinate. So in here, we are given uh, an instance x comma k, which is the, the instance and the, uh, the associated parameter uh, like that. And we ask whether uh, this instance belongs to our language. In other words, whether it's a yes instance of our problem. Um, so then uh, the next ingredient uh, what we need, th that we need to understand is what does it mean that the problem is tractable for us, uh, for the complexity theory that we are uh, talking about. So in the theory of NP hardness, tractability is defined as a polynomial time uh, solvability, existence of a polynomial time algorithm that determines whether um, an instance, a given instance, is a yes instance. In uh, parameterized hardness, uh, as you probably expect, tractability is, is defined as fixed parameter tractability. So a problem that is easy is a problem that's a fixed parameter tractable. Yep. So then you need to have also a hardness assumption. You need to assume that some problem is not 
uh, it's not uh, tractable in order to be able to to, uh, to deduce that other problems are probably also not uh, solvable. So the usual assumption in, in the theory of NP-hardness that you make is that the SAT problem, given a uh, Boolean propositional formula, whether there is a satisfying, uh, the, there's an assignment of the variables that satisfies it, um, that this problem cannot be solved in polynomial time, right? Um, so we need to have a hardness assumption for parameterized complexity. So we need to understand whether that there is some problem that we do not expect uh, that it is a fixed parameter trial. And the usual assumption that we make here is that the problem click is not fixed parameter trial. So the click problem parameterized by the solution K is the problem where you are given a graph, say a graph G and an integer K. And the question is whether in this graph you can find K pairwise adjacent vertices. Yeah, so a click of size K. So obviously this, this, uh, this problem can be solved in, in running time n power k, um, so in, uh, in XP time. Uh, however, we do not know of any FPT algorithm, and this is our base assumption for the complexity theory for parameter complexity, that this problem cannot be solved in, in fixed parameter time. And in fact, uh, during the next lecture, we'll also give some, uh, some more um, some, so, some evidence uh, that this is, a, this is a good assumption, essentially relating this assumption to sort of uh, a strengthening of this assumption. And finally, if you want to have a, a sound theory of, uh, of um, complexity theory for some notion of tractability, you also need to be able to transfer hardness. You need to deduce that if some problem uh, is hard, then some other problem is hard as well. Uh, so in the normal uh, uh, world of uh, NP hardness, usually we use uh, uh, P time reduction. So we say that, uh, say, one problem L is P time reducible to Q, if there is an, um, a reduction that takes an instance of L, outputs an equivalent instance of, of, of Q in polynomial time. Um, yeah. Uh, and then if, if, if I have a p-time reduction from, from L to Q, then I can uh, infer that if Q we could uh, solve in, in, in polynomial time, then by pipelining the reduction and the p-time algorithm for Q, we would be able to find an, a, a polynomial time algorithm for L, right? Uh, so this means that if we assume that L is hard, then Q is also hard. Because if Q was easy, p-time solvable, then L would be also uh, polynomial time solvable by, com uh, by composing um, these two algorithms. Right? So in this way, via reductions, we can transfer the hardness. We can show that Q is at least as hard as L. Uh, so this works for polynomial time uh, reductions, but essentially the same, um, the same uh, principle should apply in the parameter setting, uh, however, with an adjusted notion of a reduction. So in, in parameter setting, we'll be using something called FPT reductions or parameterized reductions, and they should essentially satisfy exactly this diagram. Yeah? So what we actually need uh, from an FPT reduction uh, to make the whole, the whole theory uh, work in a nice way, uh, what we want is that uh, uh, exactly this, this, uh, this property. That if I have a problem L that FPT reduces to Q, yes? I did not define FPT reduction so far. I just uh, tell you what, uh, what we would uh, like to expect from this notion. We'd like to expect that if L reduces to Q with respect to an FPT reduction and Q can be solved in FPT time, then so does L. Yeah? So existence of a FPT algorithm can be pushed back, pulled back through, uh, through reduction. So this means that if we are having such a notion of reduction, if the click problem FPT reduces to, to, to our favorite problem Q, then we can show that Q is not FPT unless click is FPT. Yeah, so assuming that click is not FPT, we can in this way uh, show that Q is not FPT. Why? Because, well, if Q was FPT, then by, again, uh, pipelining the reduction and the FPT algorithm, we would uh, obtain an FPT algorithm for our uh, click problem, yeah? which we assume in this box does not have.
Yeah. So these are the ingredients uh, for the complexity theory for parameterized complexity. And so far, we essentially understood all of them uh, apart from uh, this notion. So the notion of an FPT reduction, we sort of probably already see how this should work, but let's make it uh, formal. So what is an FPT reduction uh, for a problem? Uh, so for two problems, for two parameters. So imagine that we've got two parameters problem, problems, L and Q. And we would like to say, what does it mean that uh, there is an FPT reduction from L to Q? Yeah. So this is an instance that takes an instance of, uh, this is an algorithm that takes an instance of L. Yeah. So it takes uh, X comma K. This is the instance itself. This is the parameter. Uh, and outputs another instance. You should uh, understand this as an instance of the, uh, of the problem Q. So first of all, the reduction should be faithful. Yeah, uh, in the sense that the input instance is an yes instance of L. Yes, so there is a click of size K, for instance, in this graph uh, X. If and only the, uh, the output is a yes instance of the, of the problem Q. And so that's the usual thing that you expect from a reduction. Second, if we are talking about FPT reductions and we think about um, fixed parameter tractability as our notion of tractability for a problem, then our reduction should work in, in, in tractable type, so in FPT type. So the reduction should work in time, some, some computable function of the parameter times a fixed polynomial in the input size. And third, and we will see uh, why we uh, need this in a moment, the parameter blow up should be also bound. So the new parameter, the parameter of the output instance, should be bounded uh, by a computable function of the input parameter, right? So let's see our, uh, our lemma uh, that we would like to expect. I would like to prove that if L FPT reduces to Q and the problem Q is FPT, yeah, then the problem we reduce from is also FPT, yeah? Why so well? I suppose that my, 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 my favorite problem Q to which I reduce uh, can be solved in this running time. Some function of this parameter L times the size of the instance to the power C where C is some constant. Then in what running time can we solve L? Well, we can uh, pipeline the reduction uh, and this algorithm. So then the running time will be like uh, some function, uh, this function F applied to parameter L, which is now bounded by H of K. So this. Yeah, that will be this parametric factor times the size of y to the power c. But what is size of y? Well, this is the uh, size of this output instance of the reduction. So the reduction works in this running time. So it cannot produce an, uh, an output larger than its running time yeah, because it, it needs to actually write those bits uh, on the output. So I can write here g of k times size of x to the power d because this is the maximum possible output size. So now I can uh, uh, rewrite it to the form like that, times x to the power c times d. Yeah? And you can see that now this is a parametric factor. This depends in a computable way only on, on the parameter k, while this is a fixed polynomial in the, in the input size. Yeah? So this is FPT running time. So we have proved this lemma. We have proved that, uh, that if, if, if one problem reduces to the other with respect to an FPT reduction, the other is tractable, then the uh, original problem is, is tractable as well. Good. Are there any questions uh, about this uh, at this point? Maybe you can put a plus one in the chat if you are, if you are happy with this, uh, with this complexity uh, setup. I don't see too many plus ones. Are there any doubts? You, can, you should ask your questions if you are in doubts now, because uh, we will work with this notion uh, quite substantially later on. Okay, I see some plus ones. Uh, let's let's proceed further. There are also not so many of us uh, in general. Mm, right. So now, uh, given this notion of a reduction, I can uh, tell you what is this class uh, W one. 
uh, the class uh, of, of problems that are uh, that are essentially uh, like the click. Um, so I define W1 uh, as uh, this is a pragmatic point of view. We will define W1 later on a little bit differently in a more uh, uh, complexity theoretical way. But for pragmatic reasons, let me just define it as uh, the closure of the click problem under FPT reduction. Uh, so this means that um, similar as NP con consists of all the problems that can be reduced in polynomial time to thought, I will say that W1 consists of all the problems that can be FPT reduced to the click problem. Yeah? So all the problems for which click is as hard as them. Yeah? And then a problem Q is W1 hard, think of analogy to uh, NP hardness, if the click problem FPT reduces to Q, right? So in other words, Q is with respect to FPT uh, uh, fixed parameter tractability as hard as the click problem. So uh, let's see some basic observations. So first of all, uh, the class FPT, the class of all fixed parameter, tra uh, fixed parameter uh, tractable problems is contained in W1. Why? Because, well, my reduction can simply uh, in FPT time just solve the problem and then output a trivial yes or no instance of, of click. Yeah, so this is kind of true. Second observation is that the assumption that there is a collapse, uh, that there, sorry, the assumption that there is no collapse between FPT and W1, that this, this, uh, this is actually strict inclusion, is, uh, is stronger than the assumption P not equal to NP. Because if P was equal to NP, then actually click would be uh, solvable in polynomial time. So for every problem in W1, I would be able to, in FPT time, um, reduce it to, uh, to click and then solve the click in polynomial time. So every problem in W1 would be actually uh, FPT solvable. Uh, and in general, if I have any um, problem that is W1 hard, and it turns out that actually it has an FPT algorithm, then FPT is equal to W1. Because why? Uh, because if I have um, because if I have uh, a, a chain of two reductions, uh, FPT reduction from L to K and from K to Q, then actually you can easily see essentially by following the same proof we had uh, we had just before, then uh, the composition of two FPT reductions is also an FPT reduction. So this means that if I had any problem in W1 and I was able to reduce it to click, and then reduce click to my favorite problem Q uh, that turns out to be, to be FPT, then by chaining these two reductions and an FPT algorithm for Q, I would be able to solve L in FPT time, right? So this means that, uh, that this is a sort of a sound notion of reduction and sound notion of, uh, of a complexity class, uh, W1. Um, this is a complexity theoretical setup, but from the practical point of view, uh, what, really matters is the, is, is the following statement. If you have your favorite problem Q and you don't know whether it's FPT or not, if you would, uh, if you, uh, would like to show that it's probably not FPT, it suffices to give an FPT reduction from the click problem because then you show that uh, the problem uh, is not a uh, fixed parameter tractable unless it turns out that FPT is equal to W. Uh, good. Or in other words, unless click the click problem is fixed parameter tractable. So uh, let's look at some uh, very very basic examples of, of, of such FPT reductions and of uh, of uh, applications of of of, of this uh, paradigm uh, complexity paradigm. So let's uh, take first the, the the easiest possible example, the independent set problem. So just recall the independent set problem. I give them a graph. And I would like to, to find whether, uh, to determine whether there are K pairwise and non-adjacent uh, vertices. So for instance, on this graph, I could pick this vertex, uh, this vertex, and this vertex, and those are pairwise non-adjacent. This is an independent set of size three. Yeah. Um, so there is a very simple FPT reduction, even a polynomial time reduction, uh, from the click problem to the independent set problem. Uh, uh, even the reduction works in FPT time. Uh, namely, if I have a graph, I could just complement the graph and uh, preserve the parameter the same. Yeah, because a graph uh, has a click of size k if and only if its complement has an independent set of size. Yeah? 
So observe that this is an FPT reduction. It works in polynomial time, uh, in particular in FPT time. Uh, the reduction is faithful. Uh, this is the equivalent as I just stated. And thirdly, uh, the parameter is preserved. Yeah? So the, the output parameter k is bounded by a function of the input parameter, which is the identity function. So this means that this is an FPT reduction from click to the independent set problem. So the, by corollary, as a corollary, we get that the independent set problem parameterized by the, by the target budget k is w1 half. Yep. So there's another problem that probably is not a fit. Okay, so let's uh, look at a similar reduction that we have probably seen on the first uh, uh, lecture, uh, namely that for the vertex cover problem. Yeah. So um, in the vertex cover problem, uh, it, uh, it is the problem where I would like to, to, to ask whether uh, in a given graph there is a vertex cover of, of size at most k and the vertex cover is a set of vertices uh, that is uh, such that every edge is incident to one of them. So for instance, in this graph, I could take this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex, uh, and you see that every edge has at least one endpoint uh, selected. Uh, so there is a very simple uh, observation that, uh, that uh, a set X is a vertex cover if and only if its complement, the, the set of remaining vertices, is an independent set. And this is exactly what happened on these two pictures, right? Because, well, if, if every edge uh, needs to be covered, this means that after removal of the vertex, of the vertex cover, we, we end up with, with, a, with an independence. So this means that we've got some reduction from the independence set problem to vertex cover. Yeah? So from instance g, k, I give you, uh, I output the instance uh, with the same graph. Yes? However, now the, uh, for the parameter, I put n minus k, where n is the number of vertices. So is there some problem with respect to our theory? Because we know that vertex cover is actually fixed parent retractable. We've seen, we've seen probably a bazillion of, uh, of different uh, FPT algorithms for this. But this would show that, um, that vertex cover is actually W1 hard. Well, there's no problem at all, because this is not an FPT reduction. Reduction for exactly this reason. Yeah. Now you see that the output parameter of our reduction is not bounded by a function of the input parameter. Right? So sort of the measure of the complexity is, is completely changed in this reduction. So this is not an FPT reduction. So this does not show uh, that vertex cover is, is FPT. And in particular, vertex cover uh, is, uh, sorry, uh, vertex cover is not uh, a W hard. Vertex cover is actually fixed parameter. So there is no problem at all. Uh, good. Any questions at this point? Okay. If not, then uh, let's 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 move further to the to the more uh, difficult reductions. Um, now I will introduce a problem called multicolored click. Uh, it is a, a sort of a variant of a click, but this is a problem that is kind of very important in this. A theory of hardness because this is uh, the most like suitable or um, useful variant of the click that is used in in all over the place in in various parameters reduction. So when you um, want to prove that your favorite problem is is is, uh, is W one hard, uh, there is a good chance that uh, starting from a multicolored click is actually uh, a good idea. Uh, so in the multicolored click uh, problem, I'm given a graph G and I have a partition of the vertexes into K disjoint sets, uh, W1, W, uh, sorry, uh, V1, V2, V3, up to VK. So here on this, uh, on this picture, uh, K is equal to six. And I ask whether in this graph there is a click and I ask whether there is a click that con contains exactly one vertex from each of the parts. Yeah, so the click uh, should look like this. Well, I will not draw all the edges, but uh, these vertices should be pairwise edges. So note that in the multicolored click instance, actually the edges within the part do not play any role. Yeah, because uh, I will never pick two vertices from the same uh, from the same part. Uh, so this is a parameterized problem. So we can add whether it's uh, FPT or not, and actually it's probably not. Uh, so now I will show you. Uh, that this problem is, is W1 hard, so probably does not uh, admit an FPT algorithm. And therefore, because it's W1 hard, it can serve as a base, uh, um, as a base for further reductions. 
so uh, so far we know only uh, two um, uh, uh, w one hard problems: uh, the click problem and the independence problem. Let me reduce from the click problem. Uh, so on input, what I get is an instance uh, of, 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 of the click problem, so say g comma k, yes? And I would like to output then uh, a new instance, an instance of the multicolored click uh, uh, problem uh, with a new graph g prime. So this will be a modified uh, graph. Uh, it, it, I will construct in a moment. The new parameter will be exactly the same as the input parameter, yes? So uh, the parameter blow, blow up is, is governed by the identity function. So there's no problem with the parameter. So how do I uh, construct a G prime? So here is a formal uh, definition, but let's look at the, um, the picture. I start with G, here is uh, V of G, right? And I make K copies of the, of the vertex set of G and call them V1, V2, up to VK. Yes, so V1, V2, VK are the K, co are K copies of the vertex set of G. Now, this means that every vertex of G corresponds to K copies, uh, each copy in, in each of the copies of, 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 of V. Yeah? So we've got uh, U1 here, U2 here, U3 here, and so on, UK here. So now I need to define the edges uh, in my new instance. So the edges are as follows. Whenever I have an edge between U and V in my original graph, for every, uh, um, for every pair of parts, uh, VI and VJ, maybe here, V1 and V2, yes? I put, uh, all, like, I put uh, such a cross. I put an edge between UI and, uh, and, and VJ and between UJ and VI, yeah? So I will have uh, such two edges between uh, V1 and V2. I will have such two edges between uh, V1 and V3, between V2 and V3, and so on and so on. Yeah, so actually the copies of, uh, of U and the copies of V will, will form uh, a complete bipartite graph apart from uh, adding these edges. Uh, I will not add these edges, they actually do not play any role. Good, so this is my reduction. Uh, I computed now the graph G prime and I claim that uh, this my new, uh, my new graph G prime has a multicolored click, so a click that has uh, one vertex in each of the parts if and only if uh, the original, uh, um, the original uh, graph had a click of size k. And this is quite easy to see. So suppose, uh, let's first prove the, uh, the implication from bottom to top, yeah? So if I have here a click of size four, for instance, uh, well, of, of size k, yes? I would like to prove that in my, in my graph uh, G prime, there's a multicolor click of size, uh, of size k. And how do I do it? I simply take, put the first vertex of the click into the first part, the second into the second part, uh, the third into the third part, and so on, the cave into the cave part. And because of the way I, I, I define the edges in my G prime, there are pairwise edges between them. Right? So let me call it that I distribute this click. Yeah, so this, this proves the, the, uh, the implication from, from bottom to top. And the second application is equally, uh, equally easy. If I have a multicolored click like that, yes, note that uh, the copies of one vertex are pairwise non-adjacent. So because this is a click, this must correspond to pairwise different vertices of the original graph. So what I, what I can do, I can just project them uh, to, um, to a set of vertices in the original graph and they need to be pairwise adjacent because these vertices were, were adjacent in G prime. Yeah, so here I just project from G prime to G. So this proves this claim. So all in all, in summary, we gave a reduction uh, that from given a, a graph, uh, um, given an instance G comma K computes a new instance G prime comma K of multicolored click, which by this claim, the reduction is faithful. The, the, the answer to the, uh, to the problem is preserved. Uh, the reduction works in, in FPT time, that's for sure, and the parameter blow up is, uh, is, is governed by the identity function. So this is an FPT reduction. So this means that uh, we have given an FPT reduction from click, so the multicolored click uh, problem is W1 hard. Good, actually, uh, you can easily see that uh, there is also a reduction in the other direction. There is an FPT reduction from the multicolored click problem to the click problem. Well, because if I just do not put uh, any edges within every part, uh, any click in, in, my, in my instance G prime 
in, in an instance of, of the multicolor thick problem needs to pick exactly one vertex from from each of the um, from each of the uh, parts. So just uh, uh, so just putting out the, the same graph give me an FPT reduction from multicolor thick back to the click. So this means that with respect to the FPT reductions, multicolor thick and click are are equivalent. And we say that uh, then that uh, multicolored click is W1 complete. It both uh, is contained in W1 and it is hard for this complexity class. Uh, another note is that uh, because uh, I could uh, very easily just uh, complement the graph uh, when doing ev uh, everything uh, here, uh, the multicolored independence set problem defined in the same way. I would like to find an independence set that uh, picks one vertex from each of the parts is also W1, one, uh, W1 hard and W1 complete. Good, so this was the multicolored uh, click problem. Are there any questions about this reduction? Maybe some plus ones if you are not yet lost or some doubts on the, uh, Okay, I see some plus ones, uh, similar number as, as, as before. So, uh, so let's continue. Uh, so yeah, so essentially the plan now is that I will show you uh, a number of, of FPT reductions from click from multicolored click in order to show you the um, the just how do you uh, make such reductions because similarly with NP hardness reductions, so it is very easy to say just uh, make an NP hardness reduction from SAT at the time. Uh, p time reduction from from SAT, but uh, obviously for different problems we need to use different combinatorics uh, that those problems possess in order to um, uh, to show the the NP hardness uh, the, the W1 hardness. So similar as with NP hardness, there is an art of gadgeteering. With W1 hardness, there is also a certain art uh, of gadgeteering. Uh, so let's first look at the dominating set problem. Yes, this is another hard problem for parameterized complexity. Uh, so in this problem, we are given a graph and an integer k, and we ask whether in my graph I can find uh, k vertices, a set x of, of k vertices, a dominating set. Uh, so this is a set of vertices such that every vertex is either in, in it or uh, neighbors one of the vertices is picked. Yes, so the closed neighborhood of this set of vertices must be the whole vertex. So for instance, in this graph, if I pick this vertex as a dominating set, I dominate already all itself and all its neighbors. Uh, so this, this vertex is left, maybe I can pick it as well. And in this way, I get a dominating set of size two. So I will now show to you that uh, the dominating set problem parameterized by the, uh, by the budget K for the size of the dominating set is also W1 hard. And this will be a reduction uh, from the multicolored uh, independent set problem that we already know is, uh, is W1 hard. Uh, good. So on input, I've got an instance of the multicolored uh, independent set problem. So uh, just to recall, um, this is a graph where the vertex set is as, uh, as on this picture here. Um, partitioned into k different parts, yes? And the question in the multicolored independent set is whether I can pick an independent set that takes one vertex from each of the parts. And on the output, I will, uh, I will construct a new instance of the dominating set problem, yes? Uh, with a new graph G prime that will be somehow defined uh, based on G. Yes, and the, um, the output parameter, the size of the dominating set I, I will be asking for is exactly K. This will be the same parameter as the input parameter. So again, the parameter blow up is governed by the uh, identity function. Um, yeah, so how do we construct a G prime? So let me start with the vertex set of G. So I put all the vertices of G uh, in here. So they are partitioned to K parts. And what do I do? First of all, each part is turned into a click. Maybe this part I will uh, I will draw it like that to, to signify that uh, it is a click. Uh, each of the parts is actually made into a click. And moreover, to each of those clicks, I add a universal vertex. So here I put a vertex x1, here I put a new vertex x2, here I put a new vertex x3, and so on. Here I put a new vertex xk. And this vertex x1 is incident to everybody in v1. This vertex x2 in everybody here, and so on and so on. 
In my graph G prime, there will be no further edges between the parts. Yeah, so this, this whole part will be completely uh, uh, will be completely non adjacent to all the other parts. Uh, this is something that I promise for now. Um, so this means that if I would like to find now a dominating set uh, for this whole graph, whatever happens, I need to pick at least one vertex from somewhere here, from V1 or X1. I need to pick at least one vertex from somewhere here, and so on and so on. Yeah, so I will need to pick at least K vertices in order to dominate those clicks uh, um, anyway. Yeah, themselves. Okay, so now I will add uh, some additional uh, additional vertices. So imagine that in our original graph G, there was an edge between say V1 and V2, between some U in uh, in V1 and some V in V in in V2. There was an edge. So now I would like to uh, mimic this edge, uh, like um, make a gadget that corresponds to this edge in 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 our dominating set instance. How I will do it, instead of this edge, uh, let me now remove this edge because now we are drawing the graph G prime in which this, this edge is actually not present. I will add a new vertex, call it W U U U V. So this is a vertex that is defined for the edge U V. And this vertex is incident to everybody from V1 apart from U and everybody from V2 apart from V. Yeah, so there is a non-edge here and a non-edge here. And this I do for every edge. So for every pair IJ of different parts and for every edge between VI and VJ, I make such a gadget. I make such a vertex that the, with, with, the, with the corresponding gadgets. So this is our uh, definition of the instance. And now I would like to, so this is our definition of the graph G prime. And now uh, I would like to uh, argue the following claim that uh, my graph G prime has a dominating set of size at most K if and only if the original graph G had a multicolored independent set of size K, right? Because this is the, the main claim about the faithfulness uh, of the reduction. Uh, so first of all, observe that indeed there are no uh, edges between um, between uh, any of the parts uh, themselves, including the xi's, right? So if I would like to find a dominating set of G prime uh, of size k, so of size k, then my dominating set of size k needs to take exactly one vertex from each of those parts because it needs to take at least one in order to dominate say the vertex x1 uh, the, the vertex x1 in order to dominate x2 i need to take at least one vertex from this part from this set and so on to dominate x3 i need to take at least one vertex for, from this set and so on and because i have budget k for the dominating set i need to pick exactly one so i need to pick, pick exactly one vertex from here exactly one vertex from here, from V2 plus X2, and so on and so on, right? And now let's look at those vertices V, U, W, uh, v, uh, sorry, W, U, V, yeah? So when is this vertex dominated? This vertex is dominated when we did not simultaneously uh, choose U from this part and V from this part. This is the only option yeah, for this vertex not to be dominated. Of course, we, we could have been stupid and take x1, uh, but we will argue in a moment that there is no point in, 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 in taking x1. Actually, we can argue it now. So there's no point in, in, in taking x1 to the solution because if I have x1, then x1 dominates only itself and this click here and v1. However, any vertex from, from this click dominates also x1, dominates the, the click and maybe dominates something else. Yeah? So it is always better to take something, uh, uh, not to take the xi's. In other words, xi's can be always substituted with the vertices of vi's. So we can assume that the solution does not take the xi's. Yeah? So the solution needs to take one vertex from each of the parts. Right? And now a vertex v u, uh, sorry, w u v created for the edge u v is dominated by this choice if and only if u and v 
were not taken simultaneously. Because if they were taken simultaneously, they actually there are those two non edges. But if instead of this vertex V, I took somebody else, then actually V, uh, sorry, W, U, V is, 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 is getting dominated. Right? And this is exactly what we wanted to have because uh, the constraint that this vertex is, is, is getting dominated is equivalent to saying that these two vertices u and v cannot be taken simultaneously, which is exactly the constraint in the uh, multicolored independence that instance that was imposed by the edge uv. Yeah? Because I cannot take two adjacent vertices uh, to the independence set. Yes, so the, this edge puts a constraint uh, that uh, the, the, the two vertices are not taken simultaneously, which is exactly the constraint that is uh, given by the domination of WUV. So this, uh, this proves this corollary that my graph G prime has a dominating set of size of most K, if and only if uh, the original graph G has a multicolored uh, independence of size K. So in other words, uh, selections of dominating sets taking one vertex from each of the parts correspond exactly to selections of uh, multicolored independent sets in the original instance. Good, so this proves the faithfulness of this reduction. Uh, the reduction works in polynomial time, so in particular in FPT time, and the parameter blow up uh, is, uh, is identical. So this proves W1 hardness of, uh, of the dominating. Uh, is this clear? Are there any questions now? Maybe some plus ones if you are happy with the reduction. Good, I see uh, um, plus ones, so let's continue. So uh, because we asked uh, uh, ourselves before, what about uh, um, multicolored uh, uh, click uh, and being actually in W1, um, it is uh, reasonable to ask what about dominating set? Is there a reduction back from the dominating set back to click? Yes, is the dominating set actually as uh, equivalently hard as click? And it uh, turns out that no. Uh, the dominating set problem is actually hard for the W2 class, uh, a class higher than W1. Uh, so probably it is not W1 complete uh, unless W2 and W1 actually do collapse. Uh, we will define sort of uh, W2 in a moment, but for now, uh, for practical purposes, uh, we can uh, think of W2 as uh, similar as for, um, as for W1, as simply the closure of the dominating set problem under FPT reduction. Yeah, so all problems FPT reducible to dominate. So let's see some uh, W2 hard problems. So problems as hard with respect to FPT reductions as, as, as dominating set. Uh, dominating set, let, let me just say parameters by K. Yeah. Uh, so first uh, problem that we can uh, look at is the set cover problem. Uh, so recall that this is a problem actually about set systems. Uh, so we are given a universe uh, U and the family of subsets of this universe, F, and an integer K. And we would like to understand whether we can find K, K sets in our family that together cover the whole universe. So for instance, in this example, I could take this set, uh, I guess this set and this set. And in this way, I covered uh, all, the, all the black dots, so all the elements of the, of the universe. So there is a very uh, transparent and easy reduction from the dominating set problem to the set cover problem. If I have a uh, instance of the dominating set problem, yes, this is a graph G and an integer K, and I would like to ask whether there is a dominating set of size K, then this is equivalent to saying, can I cover all the vertices of the graph by K balls of radius one, right? Uh, so by K closed neighborhoods, in other words. So I can make a set cover instance by taking the universe to the, be the vertex set of the graph and my family to be just the family of all the uh, closed neighborhoods of all the vertices, right? And this, uh, this uh, instance of the set cover problem is equivalent to the instance of the dominating set problem. The parameter blow up is again identity. Uh, so this is an FPT reduction. So this means that the set cover problem parameter by the solution uh, size K is actually W2 hard. If you remember now, uh, somewhere in the beginning of the, of the uh, semester, we talked about set cover, but with different parameterization. There was actually, um, 
for instance, uh, a dynamic programming on subsets of the universe giving a two power the size of the universe uh, algorithm. So this problem is FPT for one parameterization by the size of the universe and is W too hard for a different parameterization for parameters by the solution size. And there is nothing surprising uh, with this, meaning uh, one problem can be uh, can have different parameters complexity with respect to one parameterization than from the other. Okay, another uh, very uh, closely related problem is the heating set problem. Uh, so here we are given a, uh, a universe U again and a subset of, uh, a, a set family over this universe and the budget K. Oh, uh, here I actually, yeah, I managed to copy it. Uh, um, uh, sorry for that. Um, so the question in, 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 our, uh, in our problem is, is there a heating set a heating set of size k. And the heating set of size k is a set of k elements, for instance, this element here, and uh, I guess uh, this element here, that together intersect all the sets in our, uh, in our family. Yeah, so you see that now uh, every set in our family con contains one red element. So this is a solution of size two. And I claim that the set cover parameters by the solution size k, FPT reduces to heating set uh, uh, parameters by the solution size k. And uh, the reduction is actually very simple and you probably have seen it before. So I can think of set cover instance as follows. Here is, uh, I can make a bipartite graph. On one hand, there is, uh, there is the universe. On the other side, there is the, um, there is a set family. Uh, and I put an edge if, 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 a, if an element belongs to the set. And now the question is whether I can uh, take k vertices on the right hand side in order to cover uh, all the vertices on the left hand side. Uh, I hope that this is a solution. Uh, so now I can reduce it to a heating set instance by essentially taking this thing and and and, and just copying this this bipartite graph, but now reinterpreting the things. So now instead of saying that the uh, left hand side is the universe and the right hand side is the family, I say that the right hand side is the universe and the left hand side is the family. Because now this means that I need to pick k vertices of the universe in order to intersect all the uh, elements of the family. Yeah, so by this duality of the set systems, uh, switching the, the role of the universe and the family, this is a uh, FPT reduction between the set cover and the heating set uh, problem. So this means the corollary that heating set and uh, uh, that heating set parameters by k is also a W two hard problem. Actually, both heating set and set cover are W two complete, uh, so they are reducible back to dominating. But uh, let's not go into the details here. Um, good. So now that we understand the set cover heating set, uh, maybe it's actually time to, uh, to, to, to try to understand what is the, the qualitative difference between W1 and W2. What is the difference, uh, how we can distinguish dominating set instead of complexity from click. So let's think of how we would like to, uh, uh, how we could express that uh, a set X of vertices is, is a solution to the click problem. I could say that for every non-edge of the graph, either one endpoint of the non-edge uh, is not taken or the other endpoint of the non-edge uh, um, is, is, is not taken. Yeah, this, this is a, a way to phrase that X is, uh, is indeed a click. Um, what would, how would we say that a, a set X is a dominating set? We would say that for every vertex U, there exists a vertex V such that V is in the independent set and U, V are adjacent or U equal to V, yeah? So note that in here, in the click problem, we are making only one large quantification, quantification over all the non-edges. While in the dominating set problem, we are saying for every vertex, there exists another vertex. So these are two quantifications, two large quantifications over possibly all the vertices. And this is the main difference between W1 and W2. Uh, this, uh, the, in, in the class WT, essentially, T stands for the number of large quantifications in checking the solution. So this is uh, intuition. So let's try to make it uh, a little bit more precise. 
so this is an auxiliary material. I just want to, to show it to you uh, in order to give you an, a sort of a rough understanding how this is placed in the, in the whole theory. Uh, so, uh, in order to, 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 to specify, uh, to, um, to understand better what does it mean a large quantification, we are thinking about uh, encoding problems through circuits. Um, so, imagine that here are the vertices of the graph, and I put a 1 as a vertex if, if it is taken to, the, um, to, to a click or a dominating set, or, and 0 if it is not taken to the solution. And I can make a circuit a Boolean circuit that computes whether, uh, for instance, here putting a one, here putting a one, and here putting a one makes it a click. Yeah. How does a, such a circuit for the click problem would, uh, would look like? For every non-edge, I would make a gate, uh, a not end gate, that would check that uh, the correspond that uh, in, in the corresponding two uh, inputs, there are no two ones simultaneously. Yeah, so this exactly corresponds to this uh, formula, uh, checking, uh, checking the click. And then uh, I need to make a big conjunction of all these, all, of all these checks, which, makes, make, uh, which gives me one huge uh, conjunction gate at the end, which is the output gate. Yeah? And similarly for the dominating set problem, what I would, uh, would, would do for every vertex, I would make a disjunction gate that checks whether uh, there is a, a vertex in the close neighborhood uh, that uh, that dominates the, the the vertex corresponding to this gate, and then again I make a big conjunction gate at the end that checks that all these requirements are are satisfied, and this corresponds to this universal quant uh, quantifier. Uh, so, given this uh, sort of understanding of problems through circuits, uh, we can uh, uh, phrase the following uh, weight to circuit satisfiability problem. We are given a Boolean circuit C on input and a parameter K. And the question is whether there is a satisfying valuation of the inputs. Uh, there is a valuation of the inputs that makes the circuit satisfied, that makes the input, the output of the circuit to be true. And also, the, uh, the, our input should have exactly k ones. Yeah, so this means looking for a solution of size k. Uh, so this is uh, weighted circuit satisfiability. And the class WT essentially stands for problems that are FPT reducible for this, uh, to this uh, weighted circuit satisfiability for certain classes of circuits, uh, for certain complexity measure of circuits. Um, so formally, and I would like not to go into the details uh, here, WT uh, uh, consists of all the problems that can be reduced to weighted circuit satisfiability that have circuits of this kind, where the depth is constant, bounded by some constant. In this case, the depth was uh, free. And the T stands for what's called the weft of the circuit. And the weft of the circuit is the maximum number, number of large gates on a root to leaf path. Yeah. So uh, by a small gate, I mean a gate that has a fun in two, that has only two wires incoming. And by a big gate, I mean uh, a gate that has uh, uh, unbounded fun in. So in here, the click, the circuit for the click has weft one because this is the only large gate. All these gates are binary. For the dominating set problem, this is a large gate, and each of those is also a large gate, which, which stands for the fact that uh, this quantification, this existential quantifications here, were also quantifications over the whole vertex set. Um, yes, uh, so this is the weft of a circuit, and WT are consists of problems that have uh, circuits of this kind, of weft at most. So all in all, this parameterized complexity uh, hierarchy, it looks like that, that it starts uh, from the class FPT, which uh, sort of corresponds to the P time uh, in, in the classic uh, complexity theory. So these are problems that are defined to be uh, tractable. Then you've got uh, all these uh, classes, W1, W2, W3, and so on, uh, where W1 is the FPT closure of click, uh, W2 is FPT closure of dominating set. So this is an increasing hierarchy, and we expect it not to collapse. 
at the end of the day, you have just the normal weighted circuit satisfiability problem, closure under FPT. Um, this is the class called WP. Uh, this is a weighted circuit satisfiability without any restrictions on the complexity of the circuit. And then you have uh, also more complicated classes. One class is called AW star. Uh, it's FPT uh, closure of model checking for first order logic. Uh, and this uh, kind of uh, class, it sort of corresponds to the P space uh, in, in the normal uh, complexity theory, uh, mostly because uh, FO model checking is actually complete for P space with respect to normal polynomial time reduction. And then at the end of the day, you've got XP, uh, which are sort of intractable algorithms for it. So this is just a, a quick uh, a sneak peek on the on the on the W hierarchy. What I would like to uh, for you to uh, to take from this uh, from this uh, picture is that there is a whole few, uh, there is a whole hierarchy of class WT, and they all sort of correspond to NP, in some sense, because this weighted circuit satisfiability is sort of an NP problem, um, and in a sense this means that in parameterized complexity, there is no single NP. But the whole NP is stratified into this W hierarchy with respect to the strength of the verifier, in the sense. And the strength of the verifier is expressed in, in the weft of the circuit uh, encoding this verifier. Good. So this might have been a, a little bit heavy uh, for some of you who, who, who did not have that much experience with complexity theory. I just want to, to, to give you a quick, quick glimpse of, of, of this. Uh, but for the remainder of the lecture, I would like to show you uh, more concrete hand on uh, um, reductions because from the point of view of uh, an algorithm designer, only stuff that happens here is the stuff that matters. And the sense that uh, if you are working with your favorite problem that you, you would like to uh, understand whether it's FPT or not, it is enough to just show uh, that the problem is, is, is W1 hard or W2 hard. So, from the point of view of algorithm designer, it boils down uh, to, uh, to designing um, uh, FPT reductions from click, multicolored click, uh, dominating set and similar problems. Uh, good. So from now on, we will uh, adopt this pragmatic uh, view. Are there any questions at this point? I do not see any questions. Uh, let's take a uh three seconds uh um, break and now we uh proceed to the uh, next problem uh that we are going to prove hardness for which is the node uh, kawaii multi uh, kawaii cut uh so this is the following problem well essentially i would like to prove uh give to you uh during the remaining half an hour uh free uh reduction free hardness reductions for for parameters problems to show different uh, techniques that you use for uh, for designing uh, W and hardness reduction. So in the node uh, Kawaii cut problem, we are given a graph and two integers k and s, and we would like to understand whether in our graph we can find the vertex at the small vertex at x that is of size at most k, such so that after the removal of uh, of x, the graph has at least s connected components. In other words, I would like to shatter the graph using a small set of vertices. I would like to remove a small set of vertices in order to uh, find uh, many connect connected components. So now we will show that um, node Kawai cut parameters by K plus S is actually W1 hard. Yeah, so it's probably not a feature. And this will be a reduction from click. It will not be multicolor click. It will be just the normal click problem. Uh, so for the input uh, being the, an instance g comma k of the click problem, we will output um, an instance of node uh, kawai cut um, consisting of the new graph uh, uh, g prime, some new parameter k, which would be actually equal to the input parameter k. So there will be no uh, parameter blow up in this parameter. However, s, the, the, the target size, number of connected components will be equal to 1 plus k just 2, k just 2. So which means that the new parameter k, plus, uh, k prime plus s is equal to 1 plus k plus k choose 2, which is bounded by a function of the input parameter k. And this is what we cared about. 
Yeah, so now the, the parameter is not preserved. The parameter is actually blowed up a little bit, but only by a function. So this is OK for a parameter's reduction. Uh, good. Uh, so yeah, let's start the reduction. So we start with this instance of the click. And without lots of generality, I can assume that uh, this instance has more than k vertices here. Yeah? Because if it has less than k vertices, then obviously there is no click of size k. And if it has exactly k vertices, I can just check whether it's a click of size k. right? Uh, so now I construct my graph G prime. How do I do it? I um, So let's start with my uh, vertex set of G. Yeah. Here it is. There are some edges between them. And for every edge between two vertices u and v uh, in, in, in g, I subdivide this edge. So in other words, I make a new vertex, call it w u v, yes, that is, uh, that is incident to u and to v. Yes, so all, every edge of g is, 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 is getting subdivided. So in this way, the original, so in this way, I've got here a lot of uh, the subdivided edges, but the original vertex set of, uh, of, of G became an independent set, yeah, because now all the edges got subdivided. So I turn this into a click. Yeah? I add all the possible edges between the vertices in, uh, in V of G. And this is my graph G prime. So G prime consists of the click on the original vertex set, plus for every edge, of the original vertex set, I make a new vertex that is adjacent to the endpoints of the original edge. So this is G prime. So now I claim that my original graph G has a click of size K, if and only if in my new graph G prime, there is a set of at most K vertices, such that deletion of the set of vertices uh, leaves uh, at least one plus uh, K choose two connected components. Why so? Well, imagine first that we had, uh, maybe, maybe I can draw this, uh, move this picture a little bit and draw it uh, anew. Imagine that we've got here, uh, we had here a click say of size four in my original graph G. Yeah. So this means that after the subdivision, yes, I've got uh, edges looking like that. Uh, yeah, there, there, there are six of those vertices. Maybe I will not draw all of them. And now I can take X to be the original click. Yes, so these four vertices. So now what happens? What are the connected components of my graph after I remove those four vertices, after I remove the original click? Well, uh, each of these vertices, this subdivided edge between the, uh, the vertices of the click gets split as a separate connected component consisting of one vertex, right? Because all the, both of the, end, uh, both of the in, in, uh, adjacent uh, vertices uh, got removed. And the whole remainder of the instance, yeah, is one huge connected component. And this is, uh, um, this is made clear by the fact that here are all possible edges between all the other vertices. Yeah, so all of them uh, are in one connected component and also all the other uh, edges, uh, all, all the other subdividing vertices are also in this connected component, right? So indeed, if, uh, if I have a click of size K in my original graph, then I can find a set X equal to K of K vertices such that removal of those vertices leaves me one plus K choose two connected components. Right? So this is the first implication. And uh, for the second implication, this essentially uh, uh, can be e easily seen from this, uh, from this proof uh, again. Well, if I have now a set uh, X uh, whose removal uh, gives me uh, some number of connected components, then I can easily uh, show that uh, there is no point in, in, in taking any of those uh, subdividing vertices. Why? Because if I took to my solution any of the subdividing vertices, it actually cannot um, separate anything from anything because the two endpoints are actually um, incident, uh, adjacent to each other, right? So if I took this vertex, uh, I could also remove it from the uh, from the from my set X, and I would not uh, decrease the number of connected components. Yeah? So without a loss of generality, my 
set x is in the or my set x uh, is in the original um, set of vertices v of g. And then how many connected components do I get by removing it? Well, I've got one connected component uh, consisting of everything else and one singleton connected component for every edge of the original graph that had both endpoints in my set X, right? And can there can be at most uh, KHS2 uh, of them. Yeah, so the number of connected components is one plus the number of edges in the subgraph induced by X of the original graph. And this can be at most KHS2. Uh, and here is equality if and only if this is a clique. Yeah, so this means that um, that we have proven this claim. So this means that uh, checking whether there is a, a set X that gives you that many connected components after removal is equivalent to checking whether the input uh, has a click of size K. So note that what happened here is that I used the fact that the click is a dense graph. Yes, I use the, the fact that the click is, uh, is, is a graph that has the maximum possible number of edges. And this is one, um, one trick that, uh, that, can, that, that is used uh, uh, quite often. Good, any questions about this reduction? Let me just state at the end that, uh, that actually the edge variant of this problem where I'm deleting edges to get many connected components instead of vertices, this is actually FPT and for quite non-trivial reasons. So there's a difference between the edge version and the vertex version of this problem. Maybe you can put a plus one uh, 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 to make me confident that, uh, that, that, that you are on board with this reduction. Okay, I have seen some. Uh, are there any uh, things that I should uh, repeat in this proof? Okay, let's maybe continue. Um, good, the next problem I would like to uh, um, tell you about is the list coloring problem. Uh, and here, the, uh, the, the, the thing that I would like to highlight is that you can also uh, have quite uh, interesting parameters uh, um, play, uh, to play around uh, in, in this kind of uh, uh, business. Uh, so in the list coloring problem, I'm given a graph G, yes? And I've got some uh, list function. So a list function uh, takes a vertex for, of G and uh, uh, tells me what are the possible colors this vertex can take. And uh, I number the colors 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Uh, the natural numbers are the colors. Uh, and I ask whether there is a proper coloring of the graph. So a coloring where no two adjacent vertices have the same color. And the coloring should respect the lists in the sense that um, every color of a vertex is taken from its list. So for instance, if you look at this graph here, and here are the, the, the admissible colors of the vertices, uh, then for instance, we could uh, color this vertex blue. It is on the list. Then ver uh, color blue got removed from this list, so I need to color this vertex green. Yeah. Uh, now again, color green got removed from this list, so I need to color this vertex uh, blue. Yeah. Color green is also removed from this list. Yeah because uh, it has a green neighbor. So there is a remaining a red color. I can put uh, a red color on this vertex and this way I've got a proper coloring of this graph that uh, respects the list. Um, right, so the question, this is a uh, decision problem. Does the, uh, given a graph and the, a list assignment, uh, is there a proper coloring? So now you can ask what is the, uh, the parameter? The parameter that we will be uh, considering is the truth of the graph. Uh, so you can uh, easily see that this, uh, uh, this problem can be uh, done in a running time roughly n power the true f of g by essentially uh, doing dynamic programming where for every state, where in a state you remember which vertex is colored with what color. However, the list can be very long. The list can be of, of length uh, n. So this is uh, an n power true f algorithm because there are n power true states. There are n power true possible colorings of the back. 
And we will now prove that this uh, cannot be improved to an FPT running time unless click is, uh, is FPT. We'll show that list coloring with the true parameterization is actually double one half. So what do we need to do for this? We need to make a reduction, say from multicolored independent set instance, uh, this time it will be multicolored independent set, uh, to list coloring parameters by tree width in the following sense that it, I need to take an instance of uh, multicolored independent set, yes? And I would like to output uh, a new graph G prime together with some list coloring, such that there is an equivalence. This, uh, this is a yes instance if and only if uh, this is a yes instance, this is a, this is a list correlable. And I would like now to have the, the parameter of the output instance, which is the truth of the output graph, to be bounded by a function of the input parameter k. Yeah, so what we will actually uh, show is that the truth will be just bounded uh, by k. Uh, I could put uh, any function here, uh, but, uh, but the identity function will work for us uh, here as well. Yeah? So given such an FPT reduction, uh, will prove that uh, list coloring parameters by true width is, is W1 half. Okay, so how do we construct our graph G prime? So we need to construct the graph G prime together with a list coloring. Uh, so recall that our original uh, instance of, uh, of, of multicolored independence, that this is an instance where I have uh, K parts V1 through to VK. Right. So let every, each of those parts be be numbered. Uh, the the parts are numbered one up to n. So u one i, u two i, and so on and so on. Uh, I can assume by copying the vertices it's necessary that all the parts are uh, of the same size. Good. So now we we define uh, the graph G G prime. Yeah. This it is depicted here. So for each of the parts, I will construct only one vertex. V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5, VK. Yeah? And the list associated with this vertex will consist of all the numbers from one up to n. So now what actually happened? Uh, each vertex VI will be able to choose one of the colors from one up to n. So choosing the color for the vertex VI will correspond to choosing the vertex from VI to the multi uh, in the multicolored independent set. Yeah. So we model choosing the vertices to the in in the in the multicolored independent set instance by choosing colors of vertices in our output list coloring instance, and that's the trick. Um, so now uh, we have those uh, sort of um, vertices for choosing uh, uh, um, for choosing the solution in the uh, in the input instance. We need to now uh, sort of uh, understand how do we verify that this chosen vertices, these chosen colors, are not adjacent in the original instance of multicolored independence. Um, so how do we do it? So imagine that uh, here we've got an edge, for instance, between V1 and V2, between vertices of a number A and number B here. So what I do here, I make a vertex between with, that is ad adjacent to V1 and adjacent to V2, Yes, let's call it VAB, uh, yes, or VE, if there's an edge uh, AB, yes. And this vertex will have uh, the list correspond uh, um, that, uh, that consists of two colors, A and B. Yeah, so there's a very short list here. So now observe what happens. If vertex V1 decided to have color A, decided to uh, take vertex uh, UAI, UA1 from it, and vertex V2 decided to take color B, then there would be no color left for the vertex VE, right? So the existence of the color VE, and in particular, the constraint that this vertex needs to be colored somehow, puts a constraint that I cannot take color A at V1 and color B at V2 simultaneously. And this is exactly the constraint that, uh, that we are dealing with uh, uh, in the multicolored independence. Yeah, so for every edge between V1 and V2, we put a, a vertex like that here. Yeah. Same between V2 and V3. And so on and so on. Yeah, so for every pair of vertices IJ, 
I make a bunch of vertices, one for each edge between vi and vj, yes? and each, uh, each, each vertex will correspond to uh, a constraint put by one of the edges of the original graph. So now, uh, by, by the same argumentation as before, we can see that this graph is, 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 co is least correlable, admits a proper coloring that respects the list, if and only if the original graph had a colorful uh, independent set of size k. So formally, you need to here uh, prove uh, two directions. So for instance, one direction, if this graph is least correlable, this means that the vertices v1, v2, v3, v4, v5, vk, um, have some uh, uh, color set. I cor uh, correspondingly choose vertices uh, in my original instance, and I claim that this must be an independent set. And why is it an independent set? There cannot be an edge between uh, two of those selected vertices, because if there was an edge, then the corresponding vertex here could not be colored. Yeah? And, the, uh, reduc and the implication the other way around, uh, follows in the same way. If you have here a colorful independent set of size k, then you correspondingly set the colors of those vertices uh, according to this independent set, and then each of the remaining vertices has a still a color left that uh, that it can take. Good. So the the, the final touch uh, in this proof is to observe that this graph that we have uh, 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 constructed here has true with k. Uh, why? Because if I remove those k vertices from my graph, the v1s, then the, the, the removing k vertices can decrease k by at most, uh, uh, can uh, decrease the truth by at most k. And after I remove those vertices, the graph falls into in, an independence. Yes, falls into isolated vertices, which have true with zero. Right? So this graph has indeed a true with k. Uh, and therefore, our output parameter, the truth of the graph, is bounded uh, by the original parameter. Good. So this uh, shows uh, the proof for the uh, what's it called uh, for the list coloring uh, problem parameters by the truth. Okay. Any doubts about this proof? Any questions? OK, maybe some plus ones. I see that the number of plus ones is, uh, is getting smaller, but still, but still we are on board. Good. So let's uh, understand what actually happened in both these reductions, in the reduction for the dominating set problem and for the least coloring uh, part of the truth problem. So essentially what we did, we started with multiple colored click or multiple colored independence. And that's essentially the same problem and just uh, complement the graph. And what we did, we defined, we constructed uh, K one in N choice gadgets uh, in the following sense that uh, in the multicolored click instance, uh, we need from, from each of the part to make a one in N choice. We need to take one of the N vertices. And then if we, if we define those K1 in N uh, choice gadgets, then we need to check uh, consistency uh, of those choices. We need to check that uh, indeed, for instance, in the multicolored independence set, the choices were actually not, uh, the chosen vertices were not adjusted. Yeah? So essentially a classic uh, uh, WN hardness reduction consists of designing choice gadgets uh, for choosing the vertices and then checking pairwise the consistency of the choices. And you can see an analogy here to uh, a reduction for anti-hardness that starts usually from the free set problem. In free set problem, you usually make variable gadgets that uh, define n Boolean choices, one in two choices. And then there are verification gadgets for the clauses. Yeah? So if you start from a free set, there are clauses of size three, and then you need to check consistency uh, between three variables. You need to make a gadget that, that checks its consistency. Yeah. So in some sense, in NP-hardness reduction from FreeSat, you take a search space of FreeSat, which is like two to the N, and you embed it in the search space of your favorite problem. In the W1 hardness reductions, I take a search space of click or multicolored click or any problems of this kind, which is of natural size N power K. There are K1 in N options, and I need to embed it through such a scheme in the into the search space of, of my favorite problem. 
And uh, yeah, so it's 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 this high level framework. It's 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 good to keep in mind because it streamlines a lot of uh, uh, understanding of how to actually uh, attempt doing uh, things. Uh, so sometimes a bit more elaborate uh, schemes are necessary. Uh, so uh, in particular, they involve edge selection, selecting not only the vertices from the parts but also edges between the parts. And uh, during the remaining uh, six minutes, I would like to show you one reduction uh, of this kind for the problem. This is called the odd set problem. And the problem uh, is defined as follows. Uh, this is again a hypergraph problem or a set system problem. We are given a universe, a subset, uh, a family of subsets of this universe and some uh, parameter budget Q, uh, K, sorry. And I ask whether there is a subset of, uh, of elements of size, uh, of size actually exactly K. Uh, actually at most K, it's fine. Let's, let's put it here at most K. Such that with the following property that if I look at the intersection of this set X with every, vert, uh, with every element of my, of my family, then this intersection is of odd cardinality. A little bit um, of an odd problem here. Uh, so, for instance, for this set system, I could take this vertex, this element, this element, and this element, and you see that every uh, uh, set in my set family has an intersection of size one with the selected vertex. Yeah, and one is odd, so this is a, 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 a good solution. Another solution would be to take this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. You can also see that the intersection with every uh, if every set in my in my family is is, is also uh, not divisible by two. So okay, so we are going to show that uh, this odd set problem is uh, W one hard, and again this will be a reduction. This time it will be a reduction from the multicolored click instance. Yeah? So we start with an instance of multicolored click. We want to output an an instance of of odd set. Yeah, so some universe U, some family of subsets of this universe F and some new parameter k, this new parameter k will be equal to k plus k just two. So again, it is bounded by a function of the original parameter and this is what we care about, yeah? So just for the notation, we've got those parts v1, v2 up to vk in the original multicolored click instance, let eij be the set of all edges between uh, vi and vj. Good. So the, here is the reduction. It looks a little bit scary, but let's, uh, let's go through it uh, slowly. Uh, so first I need to say what is the universe of my instance. The universe will consist of all the vertices and all the edges of my original uh, uh, instance of multicolored click. Yeah? So for each uh, part VI, I put this part as, el uh, as element of my universe. And for each uh, edge set EIJ, I put this edge set as an element of the uh, as elements of the universe. Yeah. So this is my universe, and what is my family of uh, of uh, of subsets of this universe? This is the family where every subset need to have an odd intersection with the solution. So first of all, I put the first uh, subfamily F one. Yeah, I just put each of those sets that I just drew, each VI and each EIJ. Uh, as a separate uh, uh, as a separate set in my family. So now, if I would like to uh, to look for a solution of size at most k plus two, uh, k just two, yes, and I would like this solution to have intersection odd intersection with each of those sets on the on the um, on the picture. There are exactly k plus k just two of those sets. Yeah, so my solution would need to have at least one ver at least one element in each of them in order to have an odd intersection because odd is at least one. However, my solution is of size at most this number, k plus uh, k just two, which means that my solution needs to pick exactly one element from each of those sets, right? And this is perfect, yeah, because this means that my solution needs to pick one element from each ver from each part, vi, and one element from each uh, edge set eij, which will correspond to picking vertices from different parts of the multicolored click instance and edges between the corresponding parts in the multicolored click instance. 
So now I need to, uh, uh, to add more sets. This, this will be this family F2. Yeah. Uh, that will enforce uh, this. Uh, that will enforce the, the consistency between the choices of the edges and the choices of the verbs. So what I will do? So uh, yeah, let's go through it uh, uh, through it quickly. So this is this is essentially a gadgetering uh, exercise to now uh, finish this reduction. Uh, so imagine you, I've got a part vi, and I've got a part vj. Yeah. And I've got a corresponding set of edges, EIJ, between VI and VJ. I can think of EIJ as sort of a subset of this grid, VI times VJ. Yeah, so here is this grid, and some of the cells of this grid are occupied. This means that there is an edge between the corresponding U and the corresponding V. Right? So now I add to F2 the, correspond the following sets. For every U in VI, yeah, I take the corresponding column of this of this of this grid and all the elements apart from you. So this is one set. Yeah, this is this set. Yeah. E I J U is the uh, column corresponding to you of, 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 of this grid. Yeah. This is one set that I put into my final family F. And second set that I put, this is this set is uh, the, the symmetric thing, yes? Yeah? So for every row corresponding to some vertex, say corresponding to some vertex V, I take this row plus all the elements of Vj apart from V, yeah? So this is another set that I also add to my family, yeah? So suppose now that, uh, okay, maybe there was an element here. Suppose now what happens if my solution picked in EIJ uh, some, some element. It needs to pick some element. It needs to pick some edge. Then in order for this blue set to have an odd intersection with the, with, 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 with the solution, I cannot pick this vertex from VI. Well, because then the intersection will be of size two. Yeah. I cannot pick actually any guy from here. I need to pick you. Yeah, because only then the intersection of the of the blue set with the solution will, will be of size one, which is odd. Yeah. And similarly, from Vj, I need to pick the vertex V. Yeah, because picking any of those vertices would make the intersection with the red set uh, of size two, yeah, which would be even then. So this inst this uh, family F2 forces the following constraint. If in EIJ I pick a ver um, an edge UV, then this implies that in VI I need to pick U and in VJ I need to pick V. And this is all you want, right? Because now picking the elements in the sets EIJ through this observation project to picking the uh, project to picking the same vertex here, yeah, which means that whatever we picked in the in the in the vertices in the in in, in v1 up to up to vk uh, need to be a click in the original instance of the multicolored uh, of multicolored click yeah because um, these vertices need to be parallelized adjacent and because there were some choices of um, of uh, in, in in the corresponding sets uh, eij uh, that uh, that uh, that are compatible with the choices uh, in, in VIs. Good. So this gives me the following corollary that my final uh, instance of, uh, of, uh, of odd set has a solution if and only if the original instance of, uh, of multicolored click has a colorful click of size k. Good. This was maybe a little bit quick at the end, but I hope that uh, um, that the intuition was clear. That now instead of uh, just making choice gadgets for the vertices of the graph, for the vertices, I make choice choice uh, gadgets both for the vertices and for the edges, and then uh, make consistency gadgets that uh, that check whether um, a choice of an edge is compatible with a choice of a vertex. And this is the main trick that you use in the, uh, when you are encoding, uh, selecting a click uh, through encoding um, selection of these edges. 
Good. Are there any questions uh, to this uh, to this proof? Uh, or uh, to anything else during the during this lecture because uh, now we are finished with the material. Questions? No. Okay. Then, if there are no more questions, then uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, for for this lecture. We come with exponential time hypothesis next week, which will be the the last week, uh, the last lecture of this course. So thank you very much.